I'm Tom Schumacher, president and producer of Disney Theatrical, here today for the American Theatre Wing. Our topic on working in the theatre today is the state of the theatre, this time with a particular focus on publicists and the changing nature of publicity, how we manage it, how we shape it, how we squelch it, and perhaps how we hype it. We have two fantastic guests today, some of the brightest minds working on Broadway, and yet they're used to putting words into other people's mouths, but today we're going to hear their own thoughts. First up is my old friend Rick Miramontes. Rick began his career in publicity in, uh, on the West Coast in Los Angeles as the press director for the Center Theatre Group Amundsen Theatre. There he oversaw some 25 productions, including the landmark West Coast premiere of The Life and Times of Nichols Nickleby. He also shepherded those, that Neil Simon trilogy, uh, Brighton Beach Memoirs, Biloxi Blues. After his time at the Amundsen, he became press director of the Los Angeles Festival, where he launched Peter Brook's landmark, uh, The Mahabharata, and also presented to America the first time, Cirque du Soleil. His own publicity company ran in Los Angeles for a number of years, presenting some of the big sit-downs, as well as road tours and local productions. He moved to New York in the 90s, worked with a number of press agents, and now actually has his own company, O&M. They represent Broadway shows, off-Broadway shows, and some music venues, including The Jewel, uh, the Carlisle. Next to him, on his right, is one of the great gentlemen of the Broadway theater. This is Adrian Brian Brown, a name almost synonymous with theatrical publicity. Adrian sounds smarter than us, in fact is smarter than us, but he sounds smarter than us because he was born in Oxford, England. His preparation to be a publicist in America, though, was his education. He studied, in fact, zoology. This preparation led him to working first off-Broadway with Susan Block in press and promotions for off-Broadway shows. Then, after he ran her company when she passed, he then went to briefly Solters, Solters Roskin and Friedman. He was also there for the launch of the Roundabout Theater. He then worked with a number of publicists in New York until in 1991 he joined forces with genius publicist Chris Bono and they formed the theatrical publicity powerhouse Bono Brian Brown Publicity. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you, Tom. Wow. Now, wow. if I have any inaccuracies in there, I know that you'll demand a correction as public. Immediately. Right? And that you'll put them on your own blogs. So there's actually an elephant in the room, an elephant that we've all actually taken a ride on, and I thought I would start by addressing it. Um, with full disclosure, I've been associated with the Walt Disney Company for a long time, and we are the parent company of Marvel. Marvel owns what are you going to talk about? <laughs> Adrian, you were a long time associated with Spider-Man. You were the yep. publicist while they geared up, fell apart, geared up, fell apart, geared up, fell apart. And Rick, you then were the publicist who actually opened the show yes. a little over, about, about a year ago, right? Mm -hmm. Actually opened it. So clearly there's pending litigation. And we're not going to talk about anything that might affect that. That being said, Adrian, is there such a thing as bad publicity? Yes. Um, but in the case of Spider-Man, no. <laughs> What does that mean? <laughs> no, I, I look, I think that there is bad publicity. Um, getting on the cover of a magazine, getting you know, to be the head of a Google search, I mean, getting that kind of exposure does not always translate into ticket sales. And so if, you, if the criteria for publicity is to sell tickets, then bad publicity is good when it sells tickets. And if you have an incident like um, on a much smaller scale, say Nicole Williamson, the actor, attacks another actor on stage and it makes the cover of all the newspapers and there's actually a photograph of this event happening. Um, that will generate a lot of publicity, which you would consider bad publicity, and it doesn't interact or it doesn't attract the attention of a ticket buyer. No, no, because we, we, well, many of us, yeah. many of our viewers would recall that incident. The, right. the show was what? It was called I Hate Hamlet. It was a Paul Rudnick play, um, and it was about the ghost of Barrymore, um, a young actor by the name of Evan Handler, who you may know from Sex and the City, was the young actor in it, and Nicole Williamson was the older actor. And there was a sword fight towards the end of the first act. Um, and one night, um, Nicole Williamson got carried away and actually started aggressively attacking Evan Handler. And did, when, it, when that broke in the news, did it sell tickets? No. Didn't have any impact. It had no impact whatsoever. It, 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 it had a huge buzz. It was like an international picture. Um, but it had no impact oh. on sales. Now, Rick, but on contrasting that, certainly yeah. mm -hmm. with Spider-Man, you've had an enormous amount of publicity, good publicity, but a lot of stuff about problems and, and uh, backstage drama and trauma uh, with, with actors. But uh, I have to believe that's had an impact on sales. 
I think it's had an impact on sales. It's had an impact on, I think more importantly, audiences experience of the actual show. And for once, I think this is the only example I can present to you, the publicity is actually part of the show, part of the experience of Spider-Man in a I, seat I, on Broadway. I've read about it, I've heard about it on TV, now I want to participate in the story itself? No, I, ha I have read so much about it, breathless details, all very dramatic, uh, so much so that I have a sense of ownership of that show. And I go in to see that show, and I'm actually rooting for that show. Because you've read about it. Yeah, you've read about it, and it's, tr you know, it's a giant underdog, but it's an underdog story. I, th I think that the, the important thing about what we would think of as bad publicity for Spider-Man is um, it's raised such a curiosity, but none of this would have actually um, meant a lot if it wasn't reinforcing word of mouth. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. are liking that show mm -hmm. because it wouldn't have run this long, selling as many tickets purely on the strength of bad publicity. No question. Mm -hmm. so, so what's happening is the bad publicity is piquing interest, but it's actually the word of mouth from people who've seen it and the commentators who are commenting on it in a positive way that is what I believe driving it. Well, then my follow-up question is, does shaping the story, which you're so much a part of, you, you, you help, sh you know, we have a lot of material when I as a producer sit down and then I meet with the publicist and I say, what's... What am I going to do with this? How do I present this? Does shaping the story shape the audience experience of it? Do you tee the audience up for what they're going to experience? And can you guide that? Do you want to go, Chef? I think so. I, I have to, you know, and I always say this to my staff. If you're going to take the credit, you're going to have to take the blame when it doesn't go well. And another example of it, or an example of it not going well, is the recent production of Carrie. Now, we talked about shaping the story, and of course, the creatives were hyper-concerned about the mythic story that exists about the gigantic bomb, the biggest bomb in the history of Broadway. So to give musicals, our viewers who watch this all over the country, yes. Carrie was one of the most famous big Broadway flops of all time, mm -hmm. right? But what you're working on, and what is tonight running in New York, is an off-Broadway revival of the show. It's, it's a rethinking of the show and the creators put it back in a drawer after its closing in 1988 on Broadway. Um, yes, the poster child of all great Broadway flops. And so it's been presented by MCC Theatre very bravely in a chamber musical format. Very uh, straight ahead. Uh, rather lovely production, I feel. So when we were talking about shaping the message for that show, there were many conversations about the history and do we evoke the history? Do we even acknowledge the history? Do we just sail in quietly? And quite honestly, I was an advocate for strategic um, uh, uh, presentation of that story, but blowing it out because it's a very famous story and you could have everybody buying tickets just by telling the world that Carrie's coming. Now, live by the sword, die by the sword. The centerpiece of all of those gigantic stories, New York Times et al., is that the originals, that this is a bad show. The message, in, as great as the stories were and thoughtful about the rethinking, the message in the, in the story that people were coming into, to, you know, bought tickets and coming into the theater to see because of was this is a bad show. And I think we never really dusted that off of shoulders because then the critics confirmed that by their attack. So once you position a story, then you sort of have to stick with it. I, I, I don't know about that. I, I, I think it's, more, it's a more organic process. I think when you're setting up a show, yes, you, you, you have to have a strategy. You have to decide, you know, these are the areas that are probably of most interest. We want to educate people to these areas because mm -hmm. they could be, you know, what intrigues them. You know, the, the competition for attention is so great that you, you need to isolate very clearly the, 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 the touch buttons, the points of interest. Yeah. And, and, I mean, Carrie is fascinating because I, I believe that there is, there is a good show in there. Um, and I think the hope was that with a pretty great score and some great roles that, that it should have another life. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right, it was unfortunate that no one wanted to play along with that. Exactly, and the yeah. misfire, if there's, you know, some... some make make makeover here that isn't possible it's you know assessing what the critics might have thought and the critics really 
didn't to, to me didn't couldn't give it a fair shake because they could rethink an original position precisely they they wanted to see the show that they couldn't see they wanted to see a morph of the flop maybe the flop is good this time but they had no interest in a straight ahead uh I mean, I, I, you could also dramatic it's version a, of care. It's a producing challenge here, and that mm -hmm. producers might perceive a big difference between Broadway and Off Broadway. But you realize you're wrestling, for the most part, once it's a major Off Broadway show, with the same journalists, the same everybody. In which case, it's not like you opened at the Chocolate Factory in London. It's not like you opened somewhere allowing for a complete fresh view, because That's you were true. opening it, you know, mere blocks, frankly, from where the incident happened in the first place. Right. Absolutely. Th th there's a question I, I, I think about. You know, we. Everyone talks about the good old days, but by the way, the good old days is usually just 20 years before whenever you started. It could be right? five years before. <laughs> In this case, it's moving so fast, Adrian, yeah. it could be five years ago. But we, we had this image of the publicist setting the story. And today, I'm not sure that we can do that anymore and that how often you're actually ultimately chasing the story. That it's, it, it somehow can get off and running so fast that you're, and is that just because it's faster or is that just because I'm older and I'm tired of running behind No, you? no, I, I think it's unbelievably fast. I mean, we, we, we used to have the, the grace of a few hours before something appeared in print. Now we have no time whatsoever. And, and I think once, once a story breaks, it is international in five minutes. It runs on one of the wires, it runs anywhere, and you know. When did it used to, when you started, you know? Well, well, well when I, when I started... Um, it's startling to think, but we're all in the same category, right. and it seems the, the, like we have all these experiences the, the, now. What was it like then? But the, I mean, it, it's, the, the, there, was, there was always a day or so delay. Um, so, so that if someone was fired from a show and it was very public, or, or if some other catastrophe happened, you know, th there were newspapers on deadlines, but it wouldn't actually get into the media and public consciousness till 24 hours or 12 hours later. And what could you do in that? Um, you, you, c you can prepare people. You can do damage control to the extent of the expectation management. You, you can tell the team, you can tell the producers, this bad thing is going to happen. Um, and now it's, you're normally getting an assistant in the producer's office saying, I just saw this Google alert. And, and quite often, you're learning about it that way. So it's, it, it is so fast. Um, that you're learning about it online before anyone's even called you. That, right. There's another thing that's changed in the way news is reported, in that there are certain journalists with the older institutions that are sticking to a journalistic code of ethics that will call and check, but there are now a constituency that crosses between blogger, journalist, that will just run anything. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, yes, you're right, we are chasing a lot of the time. But on the other hand, the, the individual event is over faster. So, so, oh. so, so the bad news is, is happens very quickly. The impact of it obviously happens, but then it's on to something else. So our job is becoming more about redirecting. You know, this bad thing has happened, then, okay, what's the next message we can put out? What's the next story? Well, you we know, we push? used to always say you'll be wrapping fish with it yes. tomorrow. But we, we, we're wrapping fish with it two hours later. Two hours later. I want to talk about it and, and really look at it from a number of sides because I think people are maybe a bit facile about just accepting new media and the blogosphere. Because we, we live by it and we die by it. Yes. Um, uh, we're right now in, on this day today in history, as we look back on, in previews on Newsies. This is a show that benefits enormously right now mm -hmm. by social media. The first wave of tickets, um, and a substantial amount of the show's advance, was sold by email blasts with no public advertising of any kind, just email blasts and a fan base mm -hmm. through a very strong Facebook um, page and through the, the world of, the, of Twitter. Right. And in fact, on our show, the, uh, a number of the cast members are very active Twitterers. They also make viral videos, which we've then captured and in fact have cast members making videos that we post on those sites. So we're using it, because, but it works for that show. Does, that, does it work for every show? I think it works, as you explained it, it works for a show that has a terrific brand name. Uh, well, ironically, though, this is a case of a show that, I mean, interesting Newsies, the movie, which a very few people actually know, came out a dozen years before YouTube was even invented, right? And then 12 years after the movie came out, there are kids posting themselves singing songs from it. 
it was uh, 10 years before Facebook was invented. So it wasn't like it capitalized on the original thing. It somehow but, lived in space. But right. the, yeah, but the generation has taken Newsies with it, the, the, the people who use these devices, and I predict a fabulous run for it because you're starting with that fan base. I uh -huh. find Newsies to be a fascinating vehicle because it, it, came, it came in the middle of Disney animation being so white hot with what Mencken was doing. Um, it's got Jeff Calhoun, who to me is like one of the great directors who deserves a big break. For, from an insider point of view, it's got a lot of hot buttons that make it really interesting. And, and to, to be able to tap that and get sort of the fan base early on through to, social through networking social media is a great way to go. Now, and what about other shows? Does social networking... But, but, I, but I think, I mean, for certain, certain shows, it's funny, it's certainly to try and kick it into some of the long-running shows now, would, just wouldn't work because it's that involvement thing. You, mm -hmm. you, you want to get people involved. Um, you know, our job as publicists is to to raise the questions, spread the information, and and with social media, you can end up speaking to the same twenty people over and yeah, over, over and over. And and so, how do you broaden it out of not just theater geeks, but how how do you really make it a broader entertainment option? Does that segment of the people who I think are just the over and over the the, the chat rooms. Yep. Is that drifting away because of the way Twitter and everything works? They, the, it was the first sort of social media on theater, yep. these various chat rooms where people would go on whether they had or had not seen a show right. and talk about it. Yep. Right. Are, did they have power once and do they have less power now? Is there power there? Because today you would tweet a story, right? Right. I don't think they ever really had power, but I do remember three years ago a producer calling screaming, do something about yeah. that, yeah. and they because don't really on do the chat that boards. anymore. Yes, negativity on the chat boards and about your first. When is years. the last time you had a producer angry about negativity on the chat boards, or has someone even mentioned the chat? Last boards? week. Last week, really? <laughs> is it an older producer who hasn't figured out that Twitter is faster? <laughs> no, no. I, I think what's happened is because the it, you know the, the chat rooms were alone. I mean, you know, yeah. the, 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 and they didn't have the competition of Facebook. I mean, Facebook and Twitter have created. Eight million critics. Uh -huh. Well, let's uh, go to that because because there's a there's a positive when you can use this force. It's it's you know it, there's something sort of mythic and comic book like right, it. Yes. When used for good. Uh, right. um, and by the way, for good for us is ticket sales. Absolutely, okay? always. Know, someone else might say it yeah. was you know having a rally in a square in a you know a, a foreign country that is an unrest. Yeah. So there's lots of things you can do to to advance your cause with it. But where does it where does it bite us back? negative stuff? Yeah. I mean, I, look, I, I, I think the, the, the thing about it is that it, it is so transitory that I go back to what I was saying earlier about how y you're reinventing and reshaping all the time. So, so I mean, Spider-Man is an exception because there is opportunity for bad news to come about once a week. <laughs> well, you'd know, I mean, but, mm. uh, but, but I think in general, um, for, for a show that has legs and will keep going, that the social media, if there's some negativity, it, it dies down. It, you know, it, oh, if, it, it, if there's some story. But now, let's talk about the other side of the negativity of it, because it has had an impact on the way you deal with um, legitimate, legitimate yes. journalists, yeah. um, certainly with what is a story and how fast is that story out there and whether they can break a story, right? right. Because if, if that group is already talking about it in social media, how do you get the columnists and the, and the, the feature writers to focus on something uh, has, it, has it lessened the, the ability to sell a story to them? Well, it's certainly changed the dynamic. And with Spider-Man, you had the newspaper people who had the reporters and some critics who are reporters now um, very cranky because they had really cranky editors who wanted the story and they just couldn't be on top of the story. It's, it, because know, it was happening so fast. It, but but what is the impact on critics and the role of criticism in theater? Well, I mean, I'm sorry, just a quick follow-on to that and then get to that. I, th I think what happened with um, the, the what well, we'll call it the mainstream media is they became bloggers too. Mm -hmm. so, so that every report you know, that goes into the New York Times mm -hmm. appears in a blog version first before it goes into the print edition. And also the journalistic standards are different for that. It'll be more bitchy. It'll, it'll have... It'll it'll go away from what you'd think was so, time so, style. So what we call the what what I guess I'm calling for lack of a better term and throw one to me if you can. Yeah. But the legitimate press yep. had to 
had to turn to the blogosphere. Absolutely. So the blogosphere of just the, the person on the street, Vox Populi, I, I'm just going to share my thought, then affected the legitimate yes. press by saying we have to blog because we can't print it fast enough. Yep. And then the blog article that the legitimate journalist has posted, NewYorkTimes.com, which is, by the way, I adore yep. because I can stay up to date with the news, um, that becomes then a legitimate article in the printed paper and a legitimate article in the online edition of the paper. Right. But, but it will, I mean, still, and this will change, but at the moment, the, the Times style is very much an older journalistic style in print than it is online. Really? Tell me about that. Well, if, if, if you, Arts Beat, say the column Arts Beat, will run an item um, announcing a new show, and it will be a much longer format than they'd give print space for, and it will probably, it might have, you know, announcing a new show, and it will have a bit that says, of course, their last show was a big flop, and, and, and put in all sorts of side editorial mm -hmm. that there isn't room for in print, and also wouldn't be necessarily relevant. It's just, it's just more gossipy. Um, and is that this the nature of this, that, that medium? I think it's the nature of that medium. And, and they realize that you can't just replicate the New York Times in online uh -huh. Correct. As, as the print edition. It's a different readership. It's skewing younger. And, and I think that's the direction they realize they have to go in. So then, then I'll come back to my <coughs> other question. What yep. is the student of the critics? All this, everyone's yep. out there, first preview. We always say now, we open right. in New York on our first preview. Yeah. Um, because people do start to comment. Right. What does it do to critics? I, I, I think that the, the critic that still understands the preview process, which is essential as far as I'm concerned for the development of new work, um, is reading all of this, and that they are uh, obviously absorbing all of it, and they're referring to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're running reviews that are contextualizing more than actually covering what they're seeing. That they're talking about the fact that, you know, despite chatter online, this is a good show, mm -hmm. or uh, they, they are, and I think that's also journalistic style is changing, that it's more important to report about the experience in, in your life as opposed to sitting in a theater and reviewing exactly what you're seeing on stage. It's, it's a personalization in a way, which is sort of interesting. Mm -hmm. How can you protect a show during previews? I'm thinking of last yeah. season, um, a show that I was very fond of, The, the Mother with the Hat. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought Anna Shapiro did a beautiful job staging it, but I saw it um, because of my role with the Tonys and all that. I, 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 we wait to see things when they're fully baked. Right. But people who saw an earlier version, it had an act break, it was completely transformed on Broadway. Can you as publicists protect a show when it's in that phase? I think by hand-holding. I, I, I think we can, if, if we still have faith and confidence in the fact that the reviews are going to come out at some point and there is a, this preview period, we can keep educating that and we can speak to the critics who are going to come. We can be blunt and we can say, look, it's, it's gone through a lot in previews uh, and be open about it if, if it's become like a runaway story that something's been in big trouble. Yeah, if it's but, that. But I, I wouldn't promote that, but, but the, the, there is that recourse. You know, again, we're telling the story. We're trying to position without actually saying, this is great. We, we, we are, we're trying to educate in a way, first to the press and then to the public through the press, um, that this is something they should be interested in. And I think a new, and the new media, a new generation of press needs to be educated oh, about the ways the of the theater. Yeah. Uh, that came up with Spider-Man. People didn't really understand what a because you had journalists was. who didn't cover theater as a beat Correct. covering the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who were covering the show for the first time. You know, which, which show? Is, which is a dream for us. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> why? Why is it good for you? Because because we wanted to get it outside of the theater ghetto. I, I want I want you know a war reporter to comment on Broadway. I you know, I, I want it to be exposed. You well, know, more people it certainly happened. It. I, I had a curious experience last summer coming into the country. Um, I'd been out of the country for in Australia for less than 48 hours, which is not easy to do. And as I was coming back through... Not much fun. Not, not a lot of fun either, <laughs> but, you know, it's the pain of the job. Yeah, yeah. So there I am, and I'm coming through customs in Los Angeles, not even New York, and I'm coming through customs, and the guy looks at my passport, and he says, but how long have you gone? And I say, you know, very brief period of time. And he says, what do you do? And I explain what I do, and he figures out that it's Broadway. And his first question to me was, literally, at the, at the immigration stand, he says, so what do you make of Spider-Man? And that the immigration officer knew, which means the journalist, he's reading it somewhere other than yep. the theater pages. Mm -hmm. So that's, that goes back to our first Great. point. It, the story broke in a bigger way. Right. Does the audience have the same um, reliance and or faith or interest in the, the full audience, in what critics say now that social media is out there? 
And I ask you this question knowing that each of you court critics all the time, and of course they're the most important people in the world they are um, lovely. for a moment in time. But has it affected them? I think it does. Uh, I would be interested to hear what Adrian has to say, but you know, we always say, particularly when it's not a great review, we pull mm -hmm. this out of our pocket. Look, the picture was great, the oh, headline the was pretty good. Oh. The first two graphs harmless, and nobody's going to read any more than that. But I think, in a way, that's sort of true now. The, the people don't, unless you're really interested in that particular production, you're not going to. And here, you're getting an impression, impression of the review. If, if, and 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 I also think if you're really interested, and you're probably going to make a decision for yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's obviously it's a financial decision, and also it's a time decision. Mm -hmm. You don't want to give out that much time. But but if you're really interested. I see, on the whole, the opening night and the reviews as a trigger to, oh, right, it's here. I should go get tickets. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, if, 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 there's a, if every review is really rotten, of course it has an impact. Because I think people feel stupid that, that you know, if, if, if you're being told by 10 critics this is a bad show and you still want to go, you, you've got to have real confidence in yourself. Because so that's the sense of the, in, in the aggregate, yes, all these together. Yeah. Was it ever a time when, you, if you just got a that great singular review that you were just off and running and no worries, yay, yeah. we yep. it's Sardis at 11 o'clock? Oh, totally. We certainly don't experience that no, today. No, because, because there's too many options. There's, it's, I mean, if 29% you know, of America is getting their news from pads, you know, and it's, that, that's the, now their primary news source, you know, that, that seeing one review in the New York Times, it, it's not enough. They're getting a lot of other feed. They're getting a lot of other feed. Now, that's not to say that still a review, a great review in the New York Times, a motivational review, not just a review that says I had a good time, but one that says you must see this, does have impact. Yeah. Um, if it's, I do wonder sometimes if it's the kind of show that appeals yes. to people who care what critics have to say, because yep. certainly a number of shows, including some that I've been involved with, did not do necessarily well with critics, right. but that went on to you know 13-year runs. Yeah. You know? Um, where, where critics might have beat up because the public who wants to come to that show may not be critic savvy. Well, but 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 also, and and they're not going to read the whole review, as you say. They're going to look at the picture. I mean, they're they're going to. There's a critic in London that I'm I'm very fond of, and I I, I know reasonably well, whose um, editor um, has pressured him now to be either hot or cold. Mm -hmm. Has said, I need your review to. Uh, you have to love it or you have to hate it. We need we have to in in in, in a universe where there's so many daily newspapers like we have in London, very different than here. There's so many papers to become, to make an impression. If you do, we have that here. Do we have that editorial control over critics that might exist there? I don't think that's an unusual situation. Honestly, if I were an editor, um, or if I'm the critic and I need to protect my space, who needs a critic? Who needs to write about the theater? I think that is a vibe in the newsroom. Yeah. Then I'm going to want to write something exciting. Make your statement. Who was it? Frank Rich or maybe it was Walter Kerr? One of them said, uh, my job is to write excitingly about a show, whether I like it or I don't. But, but I think that's a really good point, that, that they are fighting for space. Every, everyone who's still lucky enough to write about theater yeah. is fighting for space. Newspapers are fighting for they're space. Shrinking yeah. they're, they're shrinking their art section. They're shrinking their art sections. And, you know, and they're having to write um, you know, two paragraphs. They're having to write, you know, give it a star rating, and they don't get to write the headlines. So, so I think... I have sympathy for them. Yeah. The, you know, the, the, there, there is pressure to be really clever and smart, interesting, and actually try and get some of your own personality into it. Mm -hmm. And do you think this is affecting the, we, we often, we call it the, the jumping the gun. Mm -hmm. We have a rule, I don't know why, it, it's a rule, it's an understanding, that a review will not run until the show has opened. But now because of online even, I know a, a recent show where a, a really great critic I admire enormously, Terry Teachout, um, who writes beautifully in the Wall Street Journal and quite passionately about theater in New York as well as all across the country. Um, but Terry's review ran for a recent musical opening on Broadway, and it was a very rough review, ran before the audience had even entered the theater that night because of online. And then you had great, I mean, I, I believe Linda Weiner, who's a wonderful critic and an mm -hmm. exceptionally bright, um, bright writer, came how early to Spider-Man? Well, extremely early. It was it was really just a month and a few days after the first preview. And Jeremy Gerard, you know, one of the, the elders of criticism uh, at Bloomberg, did it. Would you think he'd be grateful to be called an <laughs> elder? Emphasis. It, on it's the respectful. <laughs> <laughs> Do you? Uh, 
is it is it a problem jumping the gun yes. for you? I, I, and look, can't, will, will, do you think it's just going to become more and more? No, of course. I, I, because I, I think it, it goes back to that. Um, there are more people commentating who don't have a background in, in, in criticism right. and are just jumping in. They're blogging. They're tweeting. Um, and so I think w they also had to explain to their editors, I mean, the, the traditional media that understands the preview process and the opening night and so forth, they had to explain to their editors why they have to wait. Um, and the editors don't get it. They the, don't get they say, it. The show's running. And especially out of town, it's, it's very hard to hold on to previews now. For a touring show, the critic expects to come the first night. Is it just an antique idea that we all... I mean, I know that we, we no, build no, our no, lives look, around I, it. I, look, I, I, I think in, in, in the same way that you know, movies hold their screenings till right before they want to open or they strategize when they hold their screenings, I, I think the, the point of previews in the theater is to give a chance for the show to be finished. Yeah. And, and that's totally open. It's advertised clearly. Um, it makes a lot of people upset that prices aren't discounted in previews as they used to be. Um, but, but the message is out there. No one is forcing you to buy a ticket in previews. Precisely. But it is, it is an understanding that this is a time that the show needs to be finished. So would you argue that our job is to um, bring along a new generation of editors to understand this? Yes. No, I, Absolutely. I, I think it's a constant education. And you know, and it's it's it is made more complicated by the fact that it's it's it used to be very easy because the critics all came opening night, they wrote their reviews, and it was in the paper the next morning. Obviously, newspaper deadlines and the electronic age means that doesn't work like that anymore. Mm -hmm. So, excuse me. So I, I think it's yes, it is is we need to protect the people who create theatre and the producers and the artists by insisting that their standard is stuck to. Um, and you know what? Our, our recourse is we don't give them press tickets. <laughs> but of course they'll, 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 buy, they'll buy. buy. But one. you know what? Most of them can't afford to. <laughs> yeah, there's that, there's that wonderful Walter Winchell <laughs> quote, you know, where um, the Schuberts famously blocked Walter Winchell from ever coming to right. a Schubert show. And he said, I, I no longer come to the openings of Schubert shows. I come three days later when they close. <laughs> um, which, which gets me to the, you know, um, it, uh, Mark Twain, I think, still holds true, even with the blogosphere, you know, never argue with people who buy their ink by the barrel. We, <laughs> even sitting here at the table, even recognizing ink by the barrel really means just the might of how there it works, it, it means something. And we are all cautious. You know, mm -hmm. I've had an interesting relationship with some writers at the New York Times, and, and, um, uh, and yet one is cautious, right? We're, we're, we, we can't help but admit to the viewer watching this they we're all conscious that everyone's thinking, now don't step too deeply yeah, into yeah. insulting someone because um, I'm going to have to curry a favor later from them because they have an enormous amount of power. But also, you know, we, our job is to be of service to the press. And with Spider-Man, you know, very oddly, I had a, a job to do in behalf of Linda Weiner, more so because they were getting pressure from their editors, and this story mattered so much to their career. And Linda, need, and she's now the reporter as well, Linda needed information in a timely fashion. So, you know, you could imagine the odd position I was put in when they were trashing us, but I needed to help them get the story this and get the an story right. Idea, because sitting here, I, I do believe you're, when I employ you, uh, um, and curiously, I've, in some connection, I've employed both right, of you, right. um, although neither of you are under the prey roll today. The, um, I think. The, <laughs> the, but I always think you're in service of me. But you're not. You're, you're in service of the producer but we have as to... well as the director, as well as the cast, as well as the, the journalist. That's the world that we live in. To be of service to you, we have to be of service to them. It's a two-way street. Now, do you treat yeah, off... now, now, I'm not going to call Linda and say, Linda, this Group. just went down. Run it. No. Clearly. I, I will spin. I, I, th I think... We we have to be, and then we we joke about you know the sleazy press agents and you know, the un nefarious That's a things. Joke? Yeah. <laughs> um, no, no, look, I, but, but, but 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 it's not just our reputations, but it's also we we have to be um, the, the the center of information. We have to be the place where, as you say, when, when something is going down with a show that's that's crazy, we have to be responsible to the journalist who we may not completely trust, but we have to present as truthful and clear a picture as we can, even if that is, we just can't comment at this time. Mm -hmm. Because 
Otherwise, what happens is, um, the, the, if the trust completely falls apart, then the journalist will feel free to run with anything, do anything. So you, you, it's, it's not playing both sides it, against the middle. It's being honest on both sides. It's, you got it. in the long run. But also, and, so, one show can employ you and ask you to do something that you know could be damaging for you. I mean, your agency is so respected, and it's so major, and it's got such credibility at Bon O'Brien Brown. So you know that you can't let some producer be unethical nope. uh, well, using you. Well, totally. And, and, and also, the expectation management for that you know, producer who say, you know, why are they writing this story? Well, this is what's happening. This is the context. This is the bigger picture. And, you know, and sometimes, often, producers just don't want to hear that. Right. You know, and, and so, so to me, you're right. The, 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 there is Are you put in an ethical, have you ever felt to be ethically yes, compromised? Yes, yes. No, no, I, I think, you know, sometimes producers have said, you know, do this or say that. And, and you have to just say, you, you can't do that now. If you do that now, the repercussions will be when it's found out or when it falls apart, will, will, yeah. will cause you and your show damage. Yeah, and uh, for those of us that are here for the long run, I, I have yeah. an extreme relationship to it because I, um, within Disney, because it's a, it, it's a corporation in America, we come under an entirely different set of governance rules yes. for everything that we do, yep. how we spend money, how we invest money, much to the confusion of, of some members of the press and the audience in terms of how we have to track it and monitor it. And, and um, uh, ethics is a huge piece of it. So right. we, we find ourselves um, keenly aware of when, where, where that line is, and, and we just don't go there. Right. Um, right. But, I, but I do know uh, uh, more rogue producers, which I want to get to by leading this question first. Um, how valuable is a quote, how, the quote from a critic to the selling of a show? Great quote make a difference. Five great quotes make a difference. We certainly put them in ads, right. and we hang them on, um, on the front of the uh, marquee, and we, we trumpet these quotes. And you know, today, you had a show open last night. There's going to be a quote meeting today, or someone's having it right now, pulling quotes. Right. Um, do they really matter? I would say, and this is just For my... For the audience, the quote of right, a right, critic. Right, right. Yeah. For, uh, my personal opinion is... If there is a consensus, if you have run the table, if you have unanimous raves, and if you can communicate that graphically somehow, totally great. We have a play right now that's running off Broadway, Tribes, uh, by Nina Rain, directed by David no, Cromer. One of the yeah, yeah, best things it's I've seen office. in a long yeah, time, yeah. and a hot, hot yeah. ticket, and it did just that. And I think the ad that ran in the New York Times, uh, not of great space, is hugely compelling. But normally I would say no. I, I think... Why quotes are valuable is it, it tells you the show's up and running. It, you know, it's here. It's, it's not coming soon, so that's a cause for action. But it also, it's, it's word of mouth. It's you, you are, whether you know who the critic is or isn't, a third party is saying that this is good. So if you know who the critic is or not, it matters. It, I, I, I think so. Which I, is and, leading and, me to my next question. Well, because I, I think there is a, um, there's a handful of... Um, and I, 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 really a small handful of producers that I think are just extraordinary and really brilliant working on Broadway today that, that just, uh, I, I look at them in awe. You know, I, I love to watch what David Stone is doing. I just, I'm fascinated by what he does. But um, this uh, actually is the point about Scott Rudin, who is, um, anyone who is lucky enough to know Scott Rudin is tortured by his genius. Um, he's brilliant. He's impossible. He's, uh, heaven forbid, get an argument with him. Um, Pity the Fool <laughs> disagrees with him. But Scott is just brilliant and has, um, has done a number of very clever things. Two with quotes that I find fascinating. One, and tell me what the show was. I remember Scott went to the New York Times online. Audiences were reviewing the show and posting right. their comments in the New York Times. And didn't he extract quotes from there and attribute them to the New York Times? The Joan Didion play, The Year of Magical, magical Thinking. It was, it was Magical Thinking, Vanessa, yeah. yeah. What, so do you remember what happened there? Because there was some kerfuffle about... The, 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 the Times got pissed off. I mean, the, the, you know, they... But what, what, what drove him to do it? Do you remember? I, 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 I just thought, I think w what started it was, um, and, you know, I, I shouldn't be speaking for him, but as, as I remember... The Times started running reader reviews. The Times was soliciting comment, comment very actively on their website. They're saying, "What did you think?" You know, right here. Um, and I think Scott felt that if the Times is soliciting people to write on their space, then it was fair game that if they said something positive, 
that he should be able to take advantage of that. So he would then run them as quotes from the New York Times. Yeah. And yeah, have, Merrick, has has Merrick anyone, yes. no, no, has but, but, but which, like which, is, which is fantastic. Yeah. And, and of course, you know, the, the Times is like, you know, you can't do that. You can't do that. And it's like, well, then, well, why are you inviting criticism from someone other than your critic, you know, in your space? It's, yeah, I, I thought it was a triumph. The yeah. thing that I'm fascinated by now is that here's Scott Rudin, producer um, of Book of Mormon, a gigantic smash hit mm -hmm. on Broadway and, and also a surprise hit. You know, I think people didn't see it coming. I think he made a lot of very clever moves with the show. Um, and he's got these wonderful quotes. Every, every journalist said something glowing about it, it I, my recollection is. And yet on television, for those of us in New York, he advertises it with tweets from famous people. Which, which, which to me is brilliant because you're getting outside the theater ghetto. You're, you're really going way broader. Now, with a project like that, it obviously has other constituencies um, because of you know, Trey and South Park and, and that sort of stuff. But I, I think you know, the, the, the whole goal for us as marketers is, is to, to reach beyond. And so I think, you know, he, he's got the New York Times and now he's telling you that people beyond that uh -huh. are, responding are responding to it. To it. Yeah. it. It does seem, it's, a, it's, it's an extraordinary invention that is just sitting there that he, yes. that he grabbed. And yeah. it's a version I suppose of the long-standing testimonial commercial. Yep. Yes. Um, and you know, I, I've had, I've done a number of versions of testimonial commercials. I find them effective, and yet we may roll our eyes at it. Um, the audience wants to find out what people are thinking. Tell me this: um, we spend so much time, you know, we're talking about critics now, but the the, the spectrum you're managing most of all is our feature articles. Mm. Um, that's really the, the thing, because it's you get a critic comes once. But in, yeah. you both have long-running shows you're managing. Adrian, you've got some real long-running shows you're mm -hmm. managing. What, what's more important to set up a show, feature articles, or that, that or the critic? And, and do people follow those feature articles in the same way? Because you spend enormous amounts of time for New York Times features, a photo in Vanity Fair, all these things we right. do. I feel it is, if, you ha if we had to make a choice here, it is the feature. The feature has more bang for the buck because it's the first cue that you present, and it, sa it provi provides so much information. Just the placement of the feature says, this is an event, this is a winner. Um, the art and the background that goes with it, much more beneath the surface to me than a review. And there is messaging that you can do to let the audience know what this is about or what, to, what area to think about. I am very excited about, we're working on a project about Judy Garland's last engagement in London. Very interesting thing, but you know, it's, it is what they would call a hard sell. An actress Why is that who, a hard sell? Because it is an actress who is unknown, it is a play, it has music in it, but it is a play. It does have the brand name of Judy Garland, of course that's, that's interesting, but it's a smallish project, and it's a play on Broadway without a star, let's face it. Anything, anything like that is a risk in this day and age. I'm very excited about a particular feature that uh, New York Magazine is pulling together because it's an essay by Jesse Green, who was a fantastic writer. It's a longish essay about what Judy Garland means today. Now that to me is the home run yes. because <laughs> yeah, that is. That, the well, low-hanging <laughs> fruit, low fruit we know will come. Well, there's a curious thing because if uh, you know, everyone always perceives themselves youthful till the end, no, at, probably at no time greater than today, where we, you know, 50 is the new 12 or whatever it's supposed to be. Yeah. That, but it does trouble me when I think about the day that Judy Garland died because I know how old I was. And um, I, I think do, a big segment of the audience may not actually know the whole Judy Garland story. There are certain neighborhoods that do. She was, of course, a gay icon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but I, I'm going to guess that a lot of 24-year-old young gay men probably don't really know the Judy Garland thing. Right? Correct. Right, so that you're having to educate a whole audience as to. True, and so what Jesse's feature will do will be, I know it will be in, written very yeah, interestingly, written. and his whole point of view will be, Judy was this, but this is how we think about Judy now and what Judy means to you, young person. And also, feature coverage begets other feature coverage. So that to me. Explain that to me. If you get a feature, you get more features? No, totally, but because I mean, it's, I mean, in the most simplistic terms, if, if you get a big story in Vanity Fair, 
um, they will syndicate that story or the pictures from that story to other outlets. They will also have a video of the photo session run on various websites. So, so it's, it becomes its own little industry, mm -hmm. each feature. Um, but, but to me, it's about just another layer of the brand. If the, sh if the show is a brand, the feature story is, is educating not just the consumer, but I'm sorry, not just the, the audience or yeah. the potential audience, it's educating the critics. Mm -hmm. And as you say, other media. So, so it, 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 it can snowball. Yeah. You know? Sometimes I wonder when y you brilliantly place a story, um, and sometimes even when the marketing group places an advertisement, how much effort has actually gone into not to influence the audience in the beginning, but to influence a series of editors who yep. are going to decide what makes the front page, what news is or is not. I, right. Because I, I know shows um, that are long running, big hits, that have been actually gotten very little publicity in, say, the New York Times. They never get mentioned, and some shows get mentioned over and over. Things take off, mm -hmm. and there, it seems that if you're in charge of the Today Show, Good Morning America, um, all you know, Fox, all these places that might cover it, it seems like you're talking to them sometimes. Uh, absolutely, so especially I mean, with the big magazine features, a big spread in Vogue or a big spread in Vanity Fair, will will help you get a TV booking. Oh, so you need that to then get on the show because it makes it, oh, if they're it, in Vanity Fair, maybe I can um, get on. Right. Yeah, I mean, what does Judy Garland mean to me? Fabulous essay. I I am fully expecting, and I'm only half joking, for R Brian Williams to become to come a calling. I, I I would expect that that is going to bring Miss Garland right back to the national news. Huh? Yeah. But you're a good publicist. I made a list <laughs> of um of people that oddly touch a story and and sometimes can influence your life and your success, and that would be my life and my success. Um, and. Uh, I, so I was just thinking this morning, certainly there's the journalist who writes the piece, we've been right. about that. there's the critic, there's the editor, which we've kind of gone around what editors mm -hmm. do, because editors, people may think it's somebody with a pencil over their head correcting spelling, but that's not the editor. What does the editor actually do? I mean, the, the, the editor is, is, is making choices about what's going to run the paper. They're um, actually assigning stories and making choices? Both. Both? Um, but, but they're also... They're, they're sometimes very resistant to it, and 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 I think you have to work with a journalist to place the story, um, because because our job is to meaning that the I mean the, the, the I might get the, the, the editor may not want to write about it, but he can't get his editor. To I was going to say yeah, the, the the editor may not want to hear a pitch from us directly, in the sense that they may feel that it's it's too sort of commercial for the way they're thinking. I mean everything every time you place a story in any media. It has to be complementary to that media, so so you know you 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 aren't going to necessarily be able to place um, a story on you know something in the cooking section I unless there's a big cooking scene in the show. Uh -huh. So 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 the the compatibility factor means that editors are always looking to see does it fit into the popular zeitgeist right now, the mission of the paper. W w how does it really fit into what they're doing? And our job is to make that clear, but sometimes it's it's better to actually go to a journalist to pitch it to that editor, uh -huh. who who will be more open to it. Um, but so that's uh, editors make choices. And now, I know that yes. I've, I've had I've had myself covered in a feature where there were all these wonderful things the writer wanted to say, and the editor didn't quite agree that they should. So they're shaping the story. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, absolutely. It's now there's another person that I, I find so <laughs> upsetting um, is the headline writer. Who's actually doing that? Because Ooh. sometimes yeah. you can have an actual good article, but the headline writer grabbed one thing. And I, Rick, I see you like oh, <laughs> rubbing oh. your face. Because sometimes the headline is a disaster, and the article is okay, but nobody, they remember the headline. Right. But the, but the author of the piece, the writer, didn't write the headline, correct? Correct. Right. Who's the headline writer? Somebody who it, reads maybe a, a, the art, a half of the article and spends five minutes on it. Or, or, I'm only exaggerating slightly. So somebody or, wrote, or, or, spent or months writing a piece, but the headline or, or, writer. Or, you know, if, if it, it's in a, a tab like the News or the Post, it's, it's just a cute play on words. Yeah. It could have nothing to do with anything. <laughs> it could be a terrible review, but if it's a happy pun or something, it'll, it'll go there. Um, How so often does the headline make it better rather than worse? Is it a 50-50 game? Well, in the We're tabloid, that's, a, that's an art form, but I have... But the tabloid headline. Well, no, I'm sorry. I'm calling the, the post and the news a tabloid. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, no. Um, I don't, does, does tabloid even mean anything anymore to anybody? It used to be in a certain level of... No, I, no, I, th I think it's... Um, commitment to accuracy and It's probably a nice euphemism, like 
a paper you pick up in a supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> so there's the there's the um, um, there's the photo editor, or the, or the, the headline writer, yeah. and then I want to get to the photo editor, right? Because I've been massacred by photo editors. Yep. Who gets to pick the photo? It, it is the photo editor. I mean, because you, we often hear complaints, like Sarah at the Times. Well, Sarah Crowe, who wrote well, right. the photographer at the Times, right, right. she's sensational. We'll say, we'll, 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 we'll say like, I can't believe they chose that picture. She'll make recommendations, but they'll. And they'll, who decides how big it is? And where it's placed. That, that I think, that's got to be an editorial decision along with the photo editor because, um, you know, for instance, today, Hunger Games opened, and that was going to be a natural on C1 of the New York Times to be a half-page picture on uh -huh. top. And Jesus Christ Superstar opened, and that would obviously be lesser because it's, in the grand scheme of things, uh -huh. in the Times' mind, one is a local event, one is an international event. Um, so, so I think the weight of the stories on the making up of the page will decide the size. Certainly the front page, and Spider-Man has had its wild share of front page New York Times stories, which is very unusual for a theater story. Um, is that because of the attractive photos? Well, there is a message that you ain't getting your story unless the art is great. Oh. And there was a moment, pre-previews, you know, there, where there was a lockdown mentality in that theater, and Sarah couldn't get her shot, and we were penalized for it. Because you, know? you didn't get good placement then. And it was, uh, ironically, the big, you know, pre-opening story, and it got short shrift because Your she didn't have didn't the... want to give her access for photographs. Correct. Well, there is a vulnerability thing of letting someone just come take well, whatever picture they want of your show. No, and, and, and I, I think that's something we talk about a lot. And we, we also, we do restrict it. We say there's certain scenes that we don't yep. want shot from shows. Yep. We, I mean, we really, we think it through. Yeah, in terms of, so you, you have a dialogue with the producers and the director, presumably, on some shows. Yeah. And then with Sarah to say you can or cannot shoot this? We, 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 we don't do it. We don't have a dialogue. We just say... The, pro the producers request that you don't shoot certain scenes. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't want to put her in the situation of having to negotiate. Yeah, I yeah. see. And yeah. did, um, is Salesman yours? Yep. And did you restrict photographs on Salesman in some way? Um, I mean, that's yeah, a I, current I, production, Philip Seymour. Right. I, I mean, in in, in honestly, Seymour. it's my office and I'm not working on it directly, but there was, a, there was a, I think, a decision to just provide photography. Ah. And black and white photography. Yeah. And that was our dream. Th that was Garland. a producer decision, and and you know, frankly, that that's that's a if you like, it's a gamble, um, because you may have the problem with placement. Yeah, they might not. They do. may decide, no, we're not going to, or whatever. But that was that was a producer decision. Uh, I'm curious uh, as we get close to the end of this uh, this dialogue today, about turnarounds, your ability to take something that isn't going well. Um, or something that's a long run, something where it's, it, and, and completely turn it around. Have, do you have an example of that? Because I, I've seen it happen, and not necessarily immediately. The one I have in my head is, was a slow turnaround, um, but it, where the public perception of the piece changed over time because of what was written or seen about it. Right. Have you ever been involved in one? When, I, when I've observed it, it's, it's been a collaboration between advertising, marketing, and press. Mm -hmm. I think if, if, if you're trying to redirect a message, we, we can put out the editorial stimulus and we can make the suggestions mm -hmm. and, and we can even show the evidence of it. Um, but it needs the weight of marketing of and advertising, together. everyone right. together to do it. Have you, Rick, ever been I involved mean, in a turnaround? I think Spider-Man was because there yeah. I always thought it was going to work. I always did and we never lost our cool and I think that was the one thing we contributed to the, to the enterprise. But we, after I mean publicity, uh, the, the, the yeah. publicity office. But after February seventh, when all of the critics finally descended on the show and lambasted it in previews, um, I thought there was a moment. There was a moment there when I thought it was. It's just. It's over. It's over. And nobody folded. And I think. I think our staunch belief in the show or posture and about the critics, I think I refer to them as a lynch mob or some such, <laughs> um, got them to that moment where the producers very bravely shut the show down, retooled, and had a second chance. Mm -hmm. A second chance not just at getting the show right, which other producers would not have done, but to be reassessed in the media, and it worked. The, the example I had in my head was um, 
a long-running show for, for Disney Theatrical, which is Beauty and the Beast, mm -hmm. which opened at the Palace Theater in mm -hmm. 1994. Right. And it was not well-received, you may recall, mm -hmm. by, the, by the critics, but hugely well-received by the audience. Um, and it both set the house record at the Palace, and then it moved to the Lunt, set the house record still today at the Lunt, longest-running show at both of those mm -hmm. theaters. Um, and by the time we closed that show, after 13 years, People wrote about it so affectionately, the beloved, the long running, the That's true. family favorite. They, and nobody was saying that when it started out. You know, that also could just be being venerable, you know, it's, it's, last man standing game. Yeah, it's funny. I, you know, I, I didn't think of that because I always remember that there was always an affection for it. You know, it, and, and it, so it wasn't one of those ones that was getting jabbed all the time. You're right, it got a horrible reception at the beginning, but it just, it became part of the landscape, and, but a happy part. Yeah. And so, would you would you ever encourage someone to be a publicist? As Absolutely, a and you know I have I I have a great success rate with hiring interns, people who come to New York to be an actor, and that's not going to happen, and they fall into this, and they love the theater just as much. It's a great career because uh, we are in the center of the Broadway world. Would you center? Would you tell someone to be a? Fan? I would, I, but I th I think is that because you've had a successful opening last night, or because you? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, no, I, look, I, I, th I think what I would v advise anyone who, who, is, who is curious about it is to go do it. I, I think, you know, everyone who's worked with us, almost everyone who's worked with us, and everyone who's been through your office starts as an intern. Um, and you learn very quickly if you have the aptitude. And if you have an, a completely obsessive nature, if you are fascinated by systems, if you are fascinated by the theater, if you love actors, you don't even have to be an actor. I, it's, it's so engrossing. And it also gives you license to deal with so many interesting people. I mean, we really are the only people in the theatre who it is totally appropriate for us to deal with the box office, to deal with agents, to deal with the, the, the whole spectrum, mm -hmm. along with the producer, of course. But, 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 but that, to me, is, is so But ironically, exciting. other than the producer, and in some cases many producers don't actually yeah. connect with anybody, but uh, real producers, other than the producer, I don't know anyone else who touches more pieces right. of it and knows more of the players than yeah. the publicists. And you know, uh, you know, Adrian, you work also with um, the National Theatre of Great Britain, yeah. run by the, the brilliant Nick Heitner. You, the joy you must have of working, you know what, you're working with it, people here, people abroad. Oh, yeah. the, some of the most extraordinary minds in, in the arts world today, right. you get to touch. Um, it's no surprise that I have enormous affection for publicists, um, not because of the, um, uh, their ability to sell you, but because of their ability to comfort you, to hold your hand, um, come hell or high water, mm. um, and to be there when we do it. So I, I thank you for uh, joining us um, today. These programs are brought to you in partnership with our friends at CUNY TV. On behalf of the American Theatre Wing, I'm Tom Schumacher, and thanks for joining us for another edition of Working in the Theatre. I'm Ted Chapin, Chairman of the American Theatre Wing. The Wing has played a vital role in New York's theatrical life for more than 60 years. Best known for creating the Tony Awards, we stand for excellence, but we also support education in the theater, and our work reaches beyond Broadway in New York. The Working in the Theater television programs, which are supported by the Annenberg Foundation and the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, are unequaled forums for discussions with today's most creative artists. Downstage Center's in-depth radio interviews were created in conjunction with XM Satellite Radio and can be heard on our website. For people who are starting their careers, we have a two-week boot camp for aspiring actors from colleges across the country called Springboard NYC. And our theater intern group provides a forum for young people who are starting their careers to build a professional network. All of the American Theater Wing's educational and media programs are available for free on demand from our website, americantheaterwing.org. Thanks for your interest in the Wing, and thanks for watching.